Did you grind this? No, no, that was just one that was already there and it's like just under the right size. Just under, huh? Yeah, I was okay. gonna have to sneak it. Yeah, because this one doesn't work well. Oh, really? Yeah, it never oh. did work well. That's Plus, a shame, it's gorgeous. Yeah, I know, I know. We learned a lot by, by having this one and finding out that it didn't work well anyway. Oh, that's rude. <laughs> so, um, talking on this, you were talking about how to center this. First off, you need to get the front of your bit square with the machine. So, this in here, you have to dial this bit in. So, once the bit is dialed in, then you can come back here, go to one side till you make a scratch, go to the other side, you know, zero this with an indicator <clears throat> or the dials. Watch your travel till you get a scratch on the other side and you're right in between the two is where your key needs to be. Now, like I was talking before, we have a problem here because like this bit here, you don't have enough clearance because all the rest of this that holds the bit, you're not going to get in here next to these clamps. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we need to pull this table off get that bigger chuck that this will drop inside of and put on here. But the other thing is, even when we get one of our brazed on tools that we've been making, which, which does work out pretty good, it's not, we're not gonna be able to, on this little slaughter, we're not gonna be able to just cut this 12 millimeter key. Oh, just not gonna work? No, no, it's not gonna work. So we're gonna go to the board and explain a little bit more about that. So we gotta bring in the big, big, big slaughter under the box. Mm. It would help, but that's not the full answer either because it's a blind, uh, blind key. Come on. So the fact of being a blind key, we, well, we could. We could because we could use a larger rod. So, yes, we could. I'm thinking that one there where you only have a 5 eighths rod, it doesn't matter what the machine is. But on the other one, our bar, like right now, we've got a 4-inch bar on it instead of a 5 eighths inch. And with a 4-inch bar, you can start doing some cutting. So we could, in this case, our hole is under two inch, but we could still put an inch and a half bar in and do some pretty good cutting. So we're working for uh, making tools and slotting with our uh, Bridgeport slaughter. What we're looking to do, first off, this is a side section of, uh, I guess I could have actually taken the real people paper that we got. We have an actual PDF of these on real drawings from the computer. But anyway, we undercut here. We cut a little bit bigger diameter so that as we cut through this, we're cutting a key into this part. We'll make it there. So it's this actual piece. So we're cutting the key into here, <clears throat> keyway, it's blind. At the end of it, this is a shank that's solid here. It's going to have a hex cut onto it. And so we cut inside when you bore this out you cut a little bit larger in this area so that you have a place for your chips to fall out if you just come in and you just try and cut a key dead into a blind end you have a whole bunch of chips that just pile up here and you don't have anything though they won't go anywhere your tool will hammer on them and you break stuff and it doesn't work yeah. what you could do if you absolutely were going to do is you could come in here make a cut leave a chip and then as you went deeper, you could go a little bit higher and leave some chips pile up in your cut. But uh, that's not the way it's normally done, be a pain in the ass, and you still don't get all the way to the bottom. You'd still have to come in and do something else to get to the bottom. Easiest is you make a relief cut below it that is a larger diameter so that when you make a stroke with your cutting tool, comes to the bottom, the chip falls out, gets out of your way. And like in this one where it's totally blind, you also are going to have to spend a fair amount of time with the air nozzle blowing the chips back out. Because usually we're doing this with a semi-blind and we'll have another spline or something on the other side so that the chips fall in. In this case, they're going to literally pack up there and Austin will have to spend a fair amount of time blowing them back out in his face and not trying not to look at them too much while they blow out. Um, <clears throat> our cutting tools, we're cutting jabbing forward and you need clearance in all directions you need clearance this way you need clearance on the sides as you're coming in you need it not to hit anything you can also make them sometimes like this one here this does not have clearance on the sides this is just square so as it starts cutting in it will guide itself a little bit on the sides of the hole also and this is um, 
sometimes not bad and probably what we will do for a finish on this. Now when you're making a bit like this you want to take a precision square and uh, hold your precision square on the side and grind this so that it is square and you could if you were really being fancy we could grind it with a machine tool and so in this case um, since we want the side square we would make this square with our precision square and then dial in on this side here so that it follows in square as opposed to what we normally do is we grind <coughs> the tool with some clearance back here we're cutting a part and we'll get it square <coughs> in the direction that's in the point that's cutting so we would have this is cutting here and we square it on this surface here and then the main reason we're doing that is like we were talking back at the machine um, besides having a square at the bottom which if the bottom is slightly off say the bottom is a little bit crooked is not that big of a problem but if we come in here and this is crooked and we go to dial there and here we're not going to hit at the same place on both sides so we're not going to get in the middle to get straight sides and that is a problem so that's why we dial this in and this would be an excellent one being wide to dial in and do our our lineup on although you then have to still once you find that center point to start um, you still have to come back and work off of that with your other bits and things which you're not going to be lined up so what we're going to end up doing in here anyway is we're going to take and we we bought a bunch of also uh, high speed steel 5 8 stock six inch long pieces pre-hardened and we use those all the time for shanks because they're a good rigid shank um, when we decide to cut one we'll cut it off with an abrasive and then we'll usually come in here and we'll put it in a collet take our cb in and face it so it's nice and square and then dress it up a little bit after for the little sander just hit it with sander a little bit <clears throat> so then we braze on we found this uh, brazing on pieces that we make to be an efficient way to make the tool and also better than we made a few of them at first just strictly grinding the high speed and that's cute but uh, generally you weaken it and just don't gain that much out of all your extra work the we found this bracing a piece on whatever shape we make to just work really good so what we'll end up doing is we'll end up making it one that is a full 12 millimeter or slightly over probably go slightly over because we'd like the key to have a little bit of uh, easy slide on and but we'll do that for a final we'll come in here we'll mark out where our key starts and I have a 12 millimeter key out there that you could even scribe off of laying there and use it for a scribe point and center with this to start with because this will be real close but then come in here with any smaller tool because it's just too much area to try and cut all at once the big problem is the flex in this 5H shank and the flex in the machine because the Bridgeport machine is just not that big of a slaughter. It'll bend this way. And so as it comes in here cutting, the pressure will build up more and more and your, your cut will taper down. It won't cut straight. Um, if you have a full width tool, it will cut straight to the sides because it's got to fit in the slot. If we have a single-sided tool, like say this, we're cutting a smaller one, doesn't fit the whole slot, we're going to come in here and it's going to taper this away also. It's going to push away from this side as we're cutting just one side. So what we're going to do here, we want to make a tool and maybe we will have to make them up, make them up for this too because of the fact of the depth. And what we want to do is we want to make a tool that doesn't actually cut the full depth. We want to leave a little bit of space. We're not cutting what well, cuts full depth, but excuse me, not the full width. We want to try and leave a little bit of space in the middle to start with. So we'll come in here with a cutting tool and we'll cut in. We'll have marked it out first, but we'll come in and we'll cut this material. And the reason we're doing that, cutting this material is there'll be a little bit of extra load on this side for the first couple cuts 
but then after that we'll have even pressure on both sides and so we'll be able to cut down to the full depth we'll come over here we'll cut down to the full depth then we'll come back in the middle and we'll chunk the middle piece out then afterwards and this will be we'll leave a little shy on each side we might go deeper on some of this we might you know because it's going to be a hit and miss on the bottom um, probably probably try and go to full depth we'll keep away from full width but go to full depth so that we don't have the loading on the bigger bit that will come in and cut it all and then uh, after we then chunk out the middle then we just come back and we'll clean it all up with a finished bit so that is the plan to make that more doable and deal with the flexing that you normally get in these our big shaper and there's a it's not the greatest video but there's a small video on there showing our big shaper and you can't really see it in the video you're looking at the end of this piece of tubing and we could go out here and look at one of the tubings actually we should do that real quick because it's a little more impressive than it shows on the machine but we're cutting a inch and five eighths wide keyway um, through 22 inches of material and the, the cut is just showing it's an insert tools that we're using the cut is showing the cutter coming straight towards you and so you don't get the perception to see how big of a cut it's taking it's a four inch diameter uh, shaft that is being used for making the cuts and then uh, it has a hydraulic cylinder built into the cutting bar I won't it's not a boring bar because we're not bo boring the same as a boring bar basically but inside of it we have a hydraulic cylinder in there that retracts the tool so that when you come back you and then it'll take another cut and we got that all set up to work with the hydraulics on the shaper we'll walk out here for a second I think we can find those pretty quick I know for sure Austin knows where they're at I think I remember where they are under the furnace under the furnace. The tubes. Yes. So. I'm going to call it the tube to confuse the British. So these little puppies here have got these keyways in there. And there's actually a, two steps in it when it's correct. These ones are all worn out. We would take those, weld them up, and then recut those. And the three had to be positioned correctly. It was a pretty good little job. But that was way before we were videoing things out here and uh, we don't do that currently because while it's cost effective to weld these up and rebuild them if we're not doing 10 of them it's not worth it and they've quit uh, as there's not as many people in the state using this machine anymore so to get 10 of these that people want rebuilt all at one time for an atlas copco bolter is just doesn't happen now and it doesn't pay to rebuild just one of them it's not worth all the setup but it's actually, while it's cutting, it's cutting along 22 inches of uh, cut each time. We had to modify the shaper also so that the feed down, the original uh, feed on that machine, it would feed down five thousandths was the finest it had. And so we put a 20 to 1 reduction on it and it will feed at half thousandths now. Um, half or quarter, I think it's half thousandths anyway. But... Uh, we put a little reduction in the drive gear to the feed and it's a very nice shaper uh, very low use when we got it so that made it uh, where we where we could do it most worn out shapers you couldn't do this job with but uh, it's it's not in the shop at all machine is sitting underneath cover greased up it has a tank over the top of it we use our crane and put half of a 10,000 gallon tank over the top of it when it's not being used